So indeed, this week we will conclude the book of Exodus. And beginning last week, we have been reading of the actual construction of the tabernacle. And the reason we have not examined it all that closely is because it's a repeat of the specifications given much earlier in Exodus. Why this tedious repetition and not just some words stating that just as the Lord had ordered, that's how Israel built it? Because we are speaking of the most important, the central, the holy, holiest item on the planet. The sacred tent has no rival. This is Jehovah's one and only sanctuary on earth. There is nothing like it. And only its later replacement, the temple, is its equal. Therefore, excruciating detail is offered to demonstrate that every effort was made to construct the wilderness tabernacle according to its blueprint. Open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 38. Exodus chapter 38. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 104. 104. Exodus chapter 38. We'll read it all. <clears throat> he made the altar for burnt offerings of acacia wood, seven and a half feet long and seven and a half feet wide. It was square and four and a half feet high. He made horns for it on its four corners. The horns were out, were uh, of one piece with it. He overlaid it with bronze. He made all the utensils for the altar, its pots, shovels, basins, meat hooks, and fire pans. All its utensils he made of bronze. He made for the altar a grate of bronze netting under its rim, reaching halfway up to the altar. He cast four rings for the four ends of the bronze grate to hold the poles. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with bronze. He put the carrying poles into the rings on the sides of the altar, and he made it of planks and hollow inside. He made the basin of bronze with its base of bronze from the mirrors of the women serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He made the courtyard on the south side facing southward. The tapestries for the courtyard were made of finely woven linen, 150 feet long, supported on 20 posts in 20 bronze sockets. The hooks on the posts and the attached rings for hanging were of silver. On the north side, they were 150 long, feet long, hung on 20 posts in 20 bronze sockets with the hooks of the posts, the rings of silver. On the west side were tapestries, 75 feet long, hung on 10 posts in 10 sockets with the hooks on the posts and their silvers, rings of silver. On the east side were tapestries, 75 feet long. The tapestries for the one side of the gateway were 22 and a half feet long, hung on three posts in three sockets. Likewise for the other side. On either side of the gate were tapestries 22 and a half feet long on three posts and three sockets. All the tapestries for the courtyard, all the way around, were finely woven linen. The sockets for the posts were of bronze. The hooks on the posts and those, their rings were of silver. The capitals of the posts were overlaid with silver. All the posts of the courtyard were banded with silver. The screen for the gateway to the courtyard was the work of a weaver in colors of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, finely woven linen. Its length was 30 feet, its height seven and a half feet all the way around, like the tapestries of the courtyard. It had four posts in four bronze sockets with silver hooks, capitals overlaid with silver and silver fasteners. The tent pegs for the tabernacle and for the courtyard around it were of bronze. These are the accounts of the tabernacle. The tabernacle of the testimony recorded as Moses ordered by the Levites, under the direction of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the priest. Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, made everything that Adonai ordered Moses to make. Assisting him was Aholiav, the son of Ahit Samach, of the tribe of Dan, who was an engraver, a designer, and a weaver in colors, in blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and in fine linen. All the gold used for the work and everything needed for the sanctuary, the gold of the offering weighed 1,930 pounds. The silver given by the community weighed 6,650 pounds. This was a bekah per person, that is a half of a shekel. 
using the sanctuary shekel for everyone 20 years old or older counted in the census, 603,550 men. The hundred talents of silver were used to cast the sockets for the sanctuary and the sockets for the curtain. One hundred sockets made from the hundred talents, one talent per socket. The 50 pounds he used to make hooks for the posts to overlay their capitals to make fasteners for them. The bronze in the offering came to 4,680 pounds. He used it to make the sockets for the entrance to the tent of meeting, the bronze altar, its bronze grate, all the utensils for the altar, the sockets for the courtyard around it, the sockets for the gateway to the courtyard, all the tent pegs for the tabernacle, all the tent pegs for the courtyard around it. About halfway through this chapter, in chapter 21, we see that one of Aaron's sons, a fellow named Ithamar, was in charge of accounting for all the materials used in making the tabernacle. But likely this is more than mere accounting. Ithamar was also the historian. He chronicled the building of the tabernacle, very probably was also instrumental and assisting Moses in writing down parts of the Torah. Now in verse 8, we're given this curious information that mirrors of the women serving at the entrance to the tabernacle were used in making the brazen laver that was this for holding water. Now the mirror effect of the water in the laver is talked about in Solomon's temple in Solomon's temple era. Some scholars think that these words about the use of mirrors was a redaction from a later time in an attempt to bolster tradition whereby the women of Israel were commended for their special contributions of their mirrors. Mirrors were rare, they were expensive, and nowhere do we find them. In the list of items God commanded the Israelites to supply, was there any mention of mirrors. So the idea here is that certain pious women went well above and beyond what was requested in giving up their extremely precious mirrors as a sign of their gratitude for what God was doing and having a dwelling place built so that he could be present among the Israelites. Now, understand, mirrors in that age were not of reflective glass. Rather, they were highly polished discs of copper or, or bronze that had been fitted with handles of varying materials. And since mirrors were prohibitively expensive for all but the wealthier, the handles were, of course, made of expensive materials like ivory. We also get a record of impressive amounts of precious materials that was used in the construction of the tabernacle, a ton of gold, little less than 7,000 pounds of silver, little more than two tons of bronze. So the precious metal alone weighed in at nearly seven tons. Now while I've described to you the weight of the various construction material in pounds and in tons, in Hebrew it's given what's called kikars and in shekels. Now the Hebrew kikar is almost always translated into English as a talent. A talent, that was just generally the largest unit of weight of that era. Just like in America, a ton is the largest unit of weight measurement. A talent at that time consisted of 3,600 shekels. And remember, a shekel was not a coin. A shekel was just a weight, like an ounce. Not for about eight centuries after this time did the use of coins come into play for the Israelis. When coins finally did become common, the term shekel became the standard unit of Israeli money, similar to the American dollar. But in the eras of Moses and Kings David and Solomon, right on up to the exile of Judah to Babylon, a shekel was not a coin. It was just a unit of weight. 
So until the Bible reaches the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, when we hear about a Hebrew having to redeem a firstborn for a half shekel, for example, it wasn't a coin. It was just a certain measurement of silver that would get weighed out on the scale. Let's move on to chapter 39. From the blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, they made the garments for officiating, for serving in the holy place. And they made the holy garments for Aaron, as Adonai had ordered Moshe. He made the ritual vest of gold of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and a finely woven linen. They hammered the gold into thin plates, cut them into threads in order to work it into the blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and the fine, fine linen crafted by the skilled artisan. They made shoulder pieces for it, joined together. They were joined together at the two ends. The decorated belt on the vest used to fasten it was of the same workmanship and materials, gold, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely twisted linen, as Adonai had ordered Moshe. They worked the onyx stones mounted in gold settings, engraving them with the names of the sons of Israel as they would in, engraved on a seal. Then he put them on the shoulder pieces of the vest to be called, uh, to be stones calling to mind the sons of Israel, as Adonai had ordered Moses. He made the breastplate. It was crafted by a skilled artisan made like the work of the ritual vest of gold blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely woven linen. When folded double, the breastplate was square. Doubled, it was a hand span by a hand span. They put on it four rows of stones. The first row was a carnelian, a topaz, and an emerald. The second row, a green feldspar, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, an orange zircon, an agate, and an amethyst. The fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They were mounted in settings of gold. And the stones corresponded to the names of the twelve sons of Israel. They were engraved with their names as a seal would be engraved, each name representing one of the twelve, twelve tribes. <clears throat> On the breastplate... They made two pure gold chains twisted like cords. Also for the breastplate, they made two settings of gold and two gold rings, and they put the two rings at the two ends of the breastplate. They put the two twisted gold chains in the two rings at the end of the breastplate and attached the other two ends of the twisted chains to the front of the shoulder pieces of the ritual vest. They also made two gold rings, put them on the two ends of the breastplate at its edge on the side facing in towards the vest. Also, they made two gold rings and attached them low on the front part of the vest's shoulder pieces near the join above the vest's decorated belt. Then they bound the breastplate by its rings to the rings of the vest with a blue cord so that it could be on the vest's decorated belt and so that the breastplate would not swing loose from the vest as Adonai had ordered Moses. He made the robe for the ritual vest. It was woven entirely of blue with its opening in the middle, like that of a coat of mail, and with a border around the opening so that it wouldn't tear. On the bottom hem, they made pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet, and woven linen. And they made bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates all the way, all the way around the hem of the robe between the pomegranates, that is, bell, pomegranate, bell, pomegranate, all the way around the hem for the robe of service, for, as Adonai had ordered Moses. They made tunics of finely woven linen for Aaron and his sons, the turban of fine linen, the splendid headgear of fine linen, the linen shorts, and the sash of finely woven linen in blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, the work of a weaver in colors, as Adonai had ordered Moses. They made the ornament for the holy turban of pure gold, wrote on it the words set apart for Adonai, like the graving on a seal, engraving on a seal, and they tied a blue cord on it to fasten it to the front of the turban, as Adonai had ordered Moses. Thus all the work for the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, was finished, with the people of Israel doing everything exactly as Adonai had ordered Moses. Then they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent and all its furnishings, clasps, planks, 
crossbars, posts, and sockets, the covering of tanned ramskins, the covering of fine leather, and the curtain for the screen, the ark for the testimony, its poles and the ark cover, the table, all its utensils, and the showbread, the pure menorah, its lamps and their arrangement for display, its accessories and the oil for the light, the gold altar, the anointing oil, the fragrant incense, the screen for the entrance to the tent, the bronze altar with its bronze grate, poles, all of its utensils, the basin with its base, the tapestries for the courtyard with their posts and sockets, the screen for the entrance to the courtyard with its ropes and tent pegs, all the utensils for the service in the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, the garments for officiating, for serving in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron, the the priest, and the garments for his sons to serve in the office of priest. The people of Israel did all the work, just as Adonai had ordered Moses. Moses saw all the work, and there it was, they had done it. Exactly as Adonai had ordered, they had done it. And Moses blessed them. Okay. <clears throat> Chapter 39 recounts the making of the priestly garments. More to the point, it goes into detail about the making of Aaron's garment. In other words, the high priest garment. And although we've covered this a few weeks ago, let's take a few minutes to review his splendid outfit. This multi-layered garment was made using yarns and cloth of colors that were particularly difficult to manufacture, and therefore they were rare and they were expensive. Blue, purple, and scarlet red. Chapter 39 spends most of its time discussing the outer and the, so the most noticeable pieces of the uniform. And therefore, it begins with the ephod. Now, the ephod was the piece that looks like an apron. And over the ephod went the breastplate. And although the ephod and, and the breastplate were two different pieces, they worked together. And therefore, typically the combination of the ephod and the breastplate was simply called the ephod. Now the breastplate was a square piece and it had 12 precious and semi-precious stones arranged in rows and columns on it. And each stone had the name of one of the 12 tribes engraved on it. So all 12 tribes were represented on the breastplate. The breastplate was then held on to the front of the ephod by means of two rings attached to the ephod, and it was worn over, worn on the chest over, over the heart. Now, shoulder straps went from the front side of the ephod to, to a piece that was worn on the back. And, and where each of these straps went over the top of the shoulders, large, a large onyx stone was affixed. And the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were placed on these two stones. Now, while it's not absolutely stated in the Bible, <clears throat> Jewish sages generally agreed that the names of the 12 tribes were divided into two groups. Six of Israel engraved on one stone, the other six on the other. Now, there's a lot of symbolism in these stones. The 12 stones, one name on each stone, were on the breastplate indicated the individuality of each tribe. But by being grouped together on the shoulder pieces, it also showed them to be unified of one source, of one father. The two large stones placed on the shoulders seem to be prophetic. That although God, to God, Israel is one, Israel will be divided into two. Some 400 years into the future, upon King Solomon's death, civil war led Israel to be split into two houses, two kingdoms. Some tribes belonging to one house, the remainder belonging to the other house. Now this long outer garment over which the ephod and the, and the breastplate were worn was solid blue. It reached to about midway between the knee and the ankle. This outer garment is usually called a robe. All around the bottom hem were golden bells and pomegranates, which alternated. 
We're told in an earlier chapter that the bells were necessary in order that the high priest would not die when doing his service in the tabernacle. The bells, you see, were more than a decoration. In fact, later on when we arrive at the temple era, the temple was just kind of a permanent tabernacle, a rope was tied onto the ankle of the high priest when he went into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The idea was that the lower priest who would be standing outside of the sanctuary would listen for the constant jingling of those golden bells all uh, as the priest moved around as he was, he was performing his annual purification rituals. If the jingling ceased for any period of time, then they would assume that Jehovah has likely killed the high priest for some breach of protocol. And then they would pull him out by that rope that was attached to his foot. Now, the logic for this procedure is perfectly understandable. Only the high priest can go into the Holy of Holies. Anybody else that would dare to venture in there would be struck dead. So, if something happened to the high priest, and they didn't have this rope, how are you going to get him out? Even a quick appointment of a new high priest. I mean, like on the spot. Okay, he's dead, now you. That wouldn't help. Because under no circumstance can a high priest handle a dead body. Not even a member of his own family. Incidentally, there is no record, biblical or otherwise, of a high priest dying and having to be dragged out of the Holy of Holies by that rope. Now, under that blue robe, there was a white tunic, and it reached from the neck to the ankle. So far in chapter 39, all these items listed are just worn by the high priest. But beginning with the white tunic, the remaining garments were common to all of the priests, no matter their level of status or duty. The turban, which is a head covering, sometimes called a mitre, although worn by all priestly levels, did not include this, this headband that was exclusively for the high priest. The head plate was a golden band that had, with, with the words, holy to Yudhe Yehovah, written on it. Now, I'd like you to take notice of how this chapter ends. The tabernacle is completed. And here we have a very formal recounting of everything the people made. And while this may seem <laughs> pretty over the top for us, these lengthy, detailed repetitions of events fit a style. They fit a custom of that era. The purpose is, is to declare to those members of Israel who were present in the wilderness and for their posterity that what they did was all that God had instructed and it was exactly as He had instructed. And it seems that they're pretty pleased with themselves for having done this. Now, we should take notice of the parallels between this part of Exodus and the completion of the tabernacle and the Genesis story of creation. Since some of those parallels overlap, chapters 39 and chapter 40, let's read chapter 40 before we discuss that. So open your Bibles again to Exodus chapter 40. Exodus chapter 40, this is the last chapter of Exodus. <clears throat> Adonai said to Moshe, On the first day of the first month you are to set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. Put, the, put, it in, put in it the ark for the testimony and conceal the ark with the curtain. Bring in the table, arrange its display. Bring in the menorah and light its lamps. Set the gold altar for incense in front of the ark for the testimony and set up the screen at the entrance to the tabernacle. Place the altar for burnt offerings in front of the entrance to the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. Set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Set up the courtyard all the way around. Hang up the screen for the entrance to the courtyard. 
take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and everything in it. Consecrate it with all of its furnishings, then it will be holy. Anoint the altar for burnt offerings with, it, with all of its utensils. Consecrate the altar. Then the altar will be especially holy. Anoint the basin and its base and consecrate it. Then bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance to the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Put the holy garments on Aaron, anoint him, and consecrate him so that he can serve me in the office of priest. Bring his sons, put tunics on them, anoint them as you anointed their father so that they can serve me in the office of priest. Then anointing will, the anoint, their anointing will signify that the office of priest is theirs throughout all their generations. Moses did this. He acted in accordance with everything Adonai had ordered him to do. On the first day of the first month of the second year, the tabernacle was set up. Moses erected the tabernacle, put its sockets in place, put up its planks, put in its crossbars, and set up its posts. He spread the tent over the tabernacle and covered the covering of the tent and, and put the covering of the tent above it as Adonai had ordered Moses. He took and put the ar- testimony inside the ark, put the poles on the ark, and set the ark cover above on the ark. Then he brought the ark into the tabernacle, set up the curtain as a screen, and concealed the ark for the testimony as Adonai had ordered Moses. He put the table in the tent of meeting on the side of the tabernacle facing north, outside the curtain. He arranged a row of bread on it before Adonai as Adonai had ordered Moses. He put the menorah in the tent of meeting across from the table on the side of the tabernacle facing south. Then he lit the lamps before Adonai as Adonai had ordered Moses. He set the gold altar in the tent of meeting in front of the curtain and he burned on it incense made from aromatic spices as Adonai had ordered Moses. He set up the screen at the entrance to the tabernacle. The altar for burnt offerings he placed at the entrance to the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and offered upon it the burnt offering and the grain offering as Adonai had ordered Moses. He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing so that Moses and Aaron and his sons could wash their hands and their feet there so that they could wash when entering the tent of meeting and when approaching the altar as Adonai had ordered Moses. And finally, he erected the courtyard around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen for the entrance to the courtyard. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of Adonai filled the tabernacle. Moses was unable to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud remained on it, and the glory of Adonai filled the ta- uh, the glory of Adonai filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel continued with all of their travels. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not travel onward until the day when it was taken up. For the cloud of Adonai was above the tabernacle during the day, and fire was in the cloud at night, so that all the house of Israel could see it throughout all of their travels. Israel has been gone from Egypt for just a few days shy of a year. Now, we really should be impressed by the fact that this incredible sanctuary complex with its furnishings and the required priestly garments was all completed in about six months. We know this is the time frame because it took a little over two months for Israel to reach Mount Sinai after leaving Egypt. Then after a little time getting settled, Moses went up and spent 40 days on Mount Sinai before he came down to attend the Golden Calf Rebellion, then went back up for another 40 days before the detailed blueprints were given by Moses to the people in order for the construction to begin. So Israel was at Mount Sinai for five to six months before they began construction of the tabernacle. Jehovah tells Moses that on the first day of the first month, they are to set up the tabernacle and consecrate it. This means that this day is just a couple of weeks shy of Passover, an anniversary of the day they left Egypt. 
The Hebrews operated on a lunar calendar. So the new moon was what they used to mark the first day of each new month. The new moon that was about to occur was not only going to be the first day of a new month, but also the first month of a new year. So by our reckoning, they were to set up the tabernacle on the first day of Aviv, which is our which is, would be somewhere in our March-April time frame. Now understand, this was the Hebrew religious event calendar year, not the Hebrew agricultural calendar year, not the Hebrew civil calendar year, not the Hebrew regnal calendar year. Didn't that make you crazy? All these different calendars they used. Now, a regnal year, remember, is how is the length of time a king held office, uh, how, how amount of time the king held office, how his time in office was measured. Now, these various calendars all existed simultaneously. They all began at different times. This is why when people want to discuss calendars with me, biblical calendars in regards to biblical events, I try to warn you off. Because it's really complex. And it can only be dealt with in a very comprehensive manner that's going to make your eyeballs roll inside your head. There's just no quick and easy way to remember answers to these sorts of questions that I get. Now, even if their ancient multiple calendar system seems just too hard for us to comprehend, understand that it made sense to the Hebrews. As an analogy, just look at our American calendar system. We have our standard solar calendar year that begins January 1st, but we also have something called a fiscal year, don't we? Which, is a, which a business can use to determine the 12-month cycle of income and expenses for tax purposes, and a fiscal year can begin pretty much any month a person chooses. Besides those calendars, don't we have something called a school calendar year? That varies state to state and county to county. Those have no bearing on calendar years or fiscal years. So even though the erecting of the tabernacle will occur on the first day of the first month of the Hebrew religious observance calendar year, it's not New Year's Day, it's not Rosh Hashanah, which is the first day of the Hebrew civil calendar year, Jewish New Year's, you see, occurs, this is fun, on the first day of the seventh month of the religious calendar year in the fall season, about September. So it was springtime when the tabernacle would be erected and then consecrated and put into operation. In fact, the, con the, the, the construction and then consecration of the tabernacle would occur just in time to use it as the central feature for Passover and the festival of matzah, which would begin on the 14th of that month, two weeks later. The tent is erected on the first day of Aviv. Passover will be just a day short of two weeks later on the 14th of Aviv. Now notice in verse 17 it says that the tabernacle was erected on the first day of the second year. This, that's not a contradiction with what was said earlier. The second year is in reference to how long the Israelites had been gone from Egypt. They were coming up at the end of the first anniversary of their release from Pharaoh's grip. That is the end of the first year and therefore the beginning of the second year that they left. I hope you're with me. Okay. In Bible speak... The day Israel departed Egypt was the first day of the first year. There's no year zero. The first day of the first year. So, exactly one year later is spoken of as the last day of the first year or the first day, one day later, the first day of the second year. That's how it works in the Bible. Now, beginning in verse 18 and continuing through verse 33, we get a very thorough rundown of the construction and then the consecration of the tabernacle. It ends with the words, so Moses finished the work. 
Now, the idea here is to bring us a fitting completion of the task, the building of the tabernacle. It's the end of a phase, which in turn readies Israel for the next phase of God's plan for them, which is to begin their journey to the promised land. The principle here is unmistakable. If you're about to undertake a journey, you have to be properly equipped. For the people of God, that means we must be equipped with God. Essentially, that was the purpose of the tabernacle, that God would be dwelling with the Israelites. Once again, this brings us to St. Paul's analogy, that we as believer, uh, believers are God's present day earthly tabernacles or temple, God's dwelling places on earth. And once the tabernacle was built, in the midst of the encampment of Israel, the tribes all carefully arranged around the tabernacle, that temporary tent where God was meeting with Moses, the one that was built outside of the encampment, would have been decommissioned. In verse 36, we are given the signal that Jehovah will give Israel each time he is ready for them to move, move on and take that next step towards his goal for them, the promised land. That's the land that was promised to Israel's ancestor, Abraham. The signal to break camp was the lifting upward of the cloud of glory that hovered above the tabernacle. To reinforce the instruction, the instruction to do that, the negative is also given. That is, if the cloud does not go up, stay where you are. Now, this Exodus episode ends with yet another God principle. When God wants you to move, he'll show you. When God wants you to move, he'll show you. All of Israel saw the cloud. They knew the signal. All of Israel knew when it was time to move on, and when it was time to stay put. This was a most visual parallel to the condition of a church-era believer who was indwelled by the Holy Spirit. God is not going to tell me to tell you when it's time for you to move. Oh, he might use me or your spouse or somebody else to encourage you or maybe to confirm to you something he's been telling you. But just as Jehovah did for Israel, he'll show each of us one-on-one -on -one, his will for our lives. Now, I'd like to conclude our story and study of Exodus by examining those parallels between the creation story, beginning of Genesis, and the building of the wilderness tabernacle. It's kind of interesting. Scholars for some time, actually, have noticed that the verses beginning in Exodus 25.1, ending in Exodus 31.1, are divided into six very apparent units. And when viewed in the original language, Hebrew, each of these distinctive units or sections is marked at its beginning by the words, Yehovah said to Moses, and immediately upon the completion of the sixth unit, we find a seventh unit is introduced, and the subject of this unit is, guess what? Sabbath. It can't be coincidental that the story of creation tells of six days of works and then a seventh day of completion and rest just as is the pattern for constructing the wilderness tabernacle. Here we have emphasized this never-ending nature of the Sabbath, its connection to the seventh day, the holiness that's intrinsic to it, and the ceasing from our works that is central to its meaning. If one compares the creation story to the building of the tabernacle, we see a similar structure and even a similar use of phrases. For instance, 
Upon God's completion of creation, the Bible says that Jehovah saw all that he had made and he found it very good. In like pattern, upon completion of the tabernacle, Moses looked it all over and pronounced it completed in, a, in accordance to God's plan. That is, the construction of the universe and the construction of the tabernacle both represent God's vision precisely brought into existence. Now, another invaluable connection to observe in the similarity between the creation and building of the tabernacle is that creation, that's our universe, consists of four dimensions. Three of these dimensions, length, width, and height, make up what we call space. The fourth dimension is time. Our universe consists only of these four dimensions. The tabernacle enshrines the sacred nature of space. The Sabbath enshrines the sacred nature of time. Therefore, the tabernacle, together with the Sabbath, is a monument to, to creation. And the Bible will make this connection, by the way, a, whole, a number of times. Now, Moses certainly did not look over all that had been built and use God's pronouncement that it was exceedingly good. He wouldn't do that. That would have gone too far because this dwelling and its furnishings had been man-made, accomplished by human hands, even though it was God-ordained. So the tabernacle was just a shadow of perfection. It was a shadow of God's spiritual dwelling place in heaven. But while it strove for perfection, it was not perfection in contrast to the perfection of the, the world, the universe, the moment after God created it and then he rested from it. Yet the intent was for the wilderness tabernacle to represent a piece of heaven on earth, a holy place. And when we get into Levit Leviticus, we see that the primary purpose of the sacrifices and the rituals were to protect and maintain, and at times repair, the relationship of holiness between God and the people of Israel. We also find that the tabernacle was erected on the first day of the first month of the new year. This corresponds to the creation narrative. That is, Creation marks the first day of the first month of the, uh, uh, of the first year in the history of history. Physical life had never before existed. And after the completion of the tabernacle, new life officially began with God, now dwelling among his newly set apart people. An entire new chapter had begun with the human race. Even more, we see this same pattern had occurred when God destroyed the world by flood. It was on the first day of the first month of the new year that the earth was finally dry. The first of Aviv, the Hebrew religious calendar's first day of the new year, is all about creation and regeneration. It is accomplished, as is all else in the Bible, in a dual manner, spiritually and physically. Just as the wilderness tabernacle was a physical earthly model of Jehovah's spiritual dwelling place in heaven, so was the Sabbath a spiritual concept with a physical counterpart. The Israelites were to physically rest after six days of work. Believers are to spiritually rest in Messiah as well as physically rest on the seventh day, which is a day of holiness. Was Moses right? Had all that God ordained to, be, to, to make his earthly dwelling place acceptable to him, had it been accomplished? Apparently, because in verse 34 we were told that the glory of God, what would later come to be called the Shekinah, filled the wilderness tabernacle. 
the dwelling place. And verse 35 tells us that due to God's presence filling up the dwelling, Moses couldn't enter it. So since that's the case, how is it that shortly with God's presence still in the tabernacle, Moses would be able to enter it? For the moment, God was just kind of stretching his legs, his new digs. He was occupying every area of the tabernacle, both the holy place, the front room of the tabernacle, and the holy of holies, the back room of the tabernacle. But soon, he would withdraw exclusively to the holy of holies, where the Ark of the Covenant with its mercy seat rested. From that point forward, he would occupy only the holy of holies portion of the tent, under that arrangement, Moses would be able to enter. Well, this ends the book of Exodus. Next up would be Leviticus and the complex and all-important sacrificial system that God has ordained for Israel. <music> 